Dan Kinyanjui is a father, businessman, biker and actor in Mombasa. He lost his wife, Drew, after she gave birth to their second son. Since losing his beautiful wife, Dan has been striving to strike a work-life balance as well as be both dad and mom to his two boys. David Karyuki is a marketing professional who was married to his late wife, Betty, for seven years. Unfortunately, she met her demise while expecting the couple's first children that happened to be triplets. David has since been trying to heal from the loss of his wife and children. Martin Kings Alwala is the CEO and founder of Palms Decors, as well as MD and co-founder of Palm Lethal Limited. He was married to one beautiful Sheila, his wife who he lost to cancer, and was left with his two boys as they continue on with their healing journey. George Ikua is the husband to the late Janet Kanini, with whom he had two lovely children, losing his wife, lover, business partner and friend after 14 years to lung cancer was a tragic shock not only to him and his family, but the country as well. Apart from his role as an ICT entrepreneur, he also runs Kanini for Africa, a foundation in his wife's honor to raise awareness and funds in the fight against cancer. Tony Washira is an insurance agent and now a single father to two girls and two boys after losing his wife to cancer. A Rotarian and counseling psychology student, Tony also spends his time mentoring and inspiring others as a way of helping him heal from his wife's death. John Gidoido is a businessman and retired civil servant. He had the privilege of enjoying marital bliss with his supporting and loving wife for 42 years. She passed on this year after losing her battle with cancer. You're watching Victoria's Lounge, a very somber mood, understandably so, and just listening to the stories of loss, it's never easy to tell, never easy to hear. Um, and, and George, I feel like it was almost like a national mourning when we heard about Janet. I wasn't in the country, but it could be felt where I was. I, I worked closely with Janet as well, and knew her very well. But nothing compares to what you felt on that day. How could you describe that day to us? Oof. I actually never talked about it. Yeah. This is interesting. Now, I, I just realized right now, wow. I talked about it. Um, trust Janet to go on April Fool's uh, as, <laughs> as a high drama she was. March 17th, our daughter's birthday. Janet had been really doing badly. Over the month of March, she was in hospital from around mid and Feb. Gets some amazing strength or willpower, I don't know from where, and convinces the doctor, I'm going home for my daughter's birthday. Hmm. And she walks out of bed and removes her IV and stands and calls me. And her ward was somewhere down a slope. And she walked halfway up and went home. We hosted guests. We had like 20 children in the house. That was her final strength. When the guests left, I had to carry her up the stairs. She was finished. As we lay in bed that night, all along through the journey, I used to put a hand on her when she's sleeping. I would send my prayers, my wishes, my dreams, everything, if you believe in laying a hand, passing energy, whatever you believe in, mm. you can feel it. It's mm. actually something you can feel. And on that evening, I felt black. It was a hole. There was nothing on the other end. Mm. And that's the day I knew. So the next day, I took her back to hospital. 
Not only that treatment, a couple of weeks. Not those weeks, I mean days, all those ones. And she said she needed to focus on her healing, to be home in time for her son's birthday, which was April the 5th. Hmm. So she said, no visitors. So I would just, of course, pop in and out or every day or every other day. And so the last 24 hours, on the Friday morning, she told me, you focus on work. Don't come, I know you're busy. Um, and my head, I said, that's nonsense. And one of the things, when we'd had, when, I mean, as you know, Janet had had very many yeah. near-death experiences. One of the things that carried her was pictures of her kids. So I decided to buy some flowers in Hurlingham, mm -hmm. get two pictures of the kids, and I surprised her at the hospital. And I told her, hey, I know you said don't want to come. I knew you needed this. Mm -hmm. And she chased me, she told me, you go, 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 go. I'm going nowhere. I'm going nowhere. I'm okay. Okay, I'm going nowhere. Go, go work. You know how traffic gets on Friday. Just get your things done in the morning. And all along, I knew the blackness, and I knew it. And, and I knew the way things had gone. But I knew Janet was a miracle. Mm -hmm. And I'd gotten used to us cheating death. We cheated death so many times, from the pulmonary embolism mm. to cancer dying in three months. We were now two years down the line to running out of money and Kenya's giving us money to changing medication to all manner of things. With this, no, nothing would not be right. So I was like, maybe I'm just being dark. So Janet used to get pissed with, uh, typical Janet. Janet used to get pissed with nurses who ask too many questions <laughs> without coming to the point and over explain answers right so she was really told you never a dull moment that girl my girl you know um so i got a call and like janet has been out of control she's yelling screaming she's out of control you need to come i'm like really this hour you can't start screaming at eight like, like, <laughs> Anyway, I'm coming, I'm coming. Then I, then as I dress, I'm like, wait, let me call again. I start calling. Yeah. And uh, I start calling them and tell them, if she hears my voice, maybe she's going to calm down. Calm down, right. She's uh, getting ready to head over. I'm like, they're not picking, but I, I get outside. Give her the phone. Stop yelling. I'll talk to her. <laughs> and he just said, Actually, I'm sorry. Like that. Like that. Whoa. Wow. This is new. I've not replayed this day. Call a friend of mine, drove me to the hospital. The most surreal thing is when you see, when you see the body. Um, so they, I found they had removed it from the ward and put her, put it on tables when they want to take you to the morgue or something, some table with stretches, and they put her there somewhere in a corner, like, a bit out, but somewhere private, a room, alone. I stormed right where she is. Now I forget she had this look of defiance. Mm -hmm. I, she fought to the end, she, this null of defiance. And I talked to her, I don't know about what, I talked to her for a whole hour. One whole hour. We talked. To the body. We talked, 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 talked. And, uh, right. So I step out. And my phone is buzzing.
someone in the hospital had leaked oh what had happened. So it was now doing the rounds. And I knew my kids uh, wake up, watch TV, and I knew they are going to see it. So I call my nanny and I tell her, get those kids out of that TV and lock that gate. Hmm. And sure enough, some press had started showing. So I zoomed home, called my brother-in-law and my, my sister-in-law and told them, this happened, just run there, sort it out. Typical hospital, they call you, they say, so are you using our morgue or there's some very insensitive things that happened on that day. Oh my goodness. <laughs> like, okay, no, this. I tell my brother in law, just grab the body, call Montezuma, tell them to come pick it, I'll sort it out. I need to go and tell the kids. They need to hear it from me. The worst thing would be for them to hear it okay. from TV or some crazy neighbor who runs in screaming and moaning. I got home. actually passed some <laughs> cameras at the gate. Um, ran in, grabbed the kids. Uh, took them upstairs. Told them, uh, Mommy is the Lord and my son just said, so she's dead. Oh, my. And walked out. And my daughter says, okay, then I want to go and see her. A weird day. And after that, I think I just collapsed. And, not collapsed, just... Yeah. So, by then, it was all over the news, the whole country. It was all over the place. Uh, actually, for me, the last five months, the emotion has just been mm. extreme anger. Um, Finally, you even get angry at her for going. Anger, because there's no prayer we didn't say. Right. Anger for the general system mm. of healthcare in our country. Mm. And most anger that she wouldn't get to see her kids. Mm. That's what breaks me every day. Mm. She won't see these people. And I mean, we, we get by, but crazy day crazy day man I know a day that continues to live with you even now as you're talking about it you're reliving all those moments it's day, man. and and the fact that you had to go through this in the public eye yeah that, adds that, another that was hard guy. like the, everyone is looking for a good story or a bad story a story either way so they will come up they will chase all the good stories they will for lack of a better word, die for the bad stories. Mm. Um, try and... So you, you're not only grieving, but you're playing in a court of public opinion. Right. And it's... Uh, in this day of social media, it's people hiding behind handles. Um, and then you're also going through... Your extended family is also joining the court of public opinion, your neighbours. You... <laughs> To grieve in the public I, opinion is, you have to be made of some strength that is Absolutely. very different. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's not grieving at all, I can't imagine, because even now, yeah, la vie. it will take time. It, it will take time. time. It takes time. Wow, amazing. The stories coming out of this, unbelievable, the kinds of strength that you have to even share. Thank you so much. Let's take a short break here on Victoria's Lounge. Much more ahead. I know the impact is very heavy even still now. I can hear in, the, in your voices the weight of the experience, but what you are doing to cope through this, um, now you have a, a baby that you have to bring into the world now, Dan, and raise and one day tell them about their mother. You know, um, what is the healing process for you now? I mean, I know you're nowhere close to closure, but what is it like? I think one of the most 
important things for me was to have a good support system. Yeah. One person that I will single out is, and I thank God for her, is my own mother. Mm. She raised me to the person I am today. Um, she was very good friends with uh, Drew. They were tight. <laughs> And she has sacrificed and opted to actually come move into my place Monday to Friday to take care of Daryl so that I can get food on the table. And for me, another way of coping is I busy myself a lot. I try and not be idle. I used to be a very fun-loving guy. I try and not change that. I try and make sure whatever routines that had been going on when she was there are maintained. For example, we used to have date nights every single Wednesday. We tried to make it happen. Even in instances where we would fight, we would still uphold date night. A uh, general rule in fighting for us was do not go to bed without talking it out. So you could fight in the morning, total silence the whole day, but you'll get talking in yeah, bed. Yeah. There's no replacement for Drew. Absolutely. There'll never be another Drew. Mm. In the coming years, if I was to settle down with anyone, there'll never be a mother to, to my boys. So it's something that I don't know, and I'm taking it a day at a time. Yeah, yeah. My boys will not miss that love. I'll embark on whatever projects that we had already put in place with Drew. She's not there, but I'll try my best to see it to completion. And one relation that I'm really trying to fix is my relationship with God. Mm. What's be the honest. story behind this? <laughs> Drew loved this. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's just a lesson that she would randomly put on. Um, on the night that we walked out of the house on the 20th, very early in the morning, I remember she just took this on and wrapped it around herself. And um, the interesting bit is the message that was there. Mm. Um, it's in Swahili. Mungu inuliwe kwani siku hii ni akipeke. This is a unique day. I never read it until the 23rd when I was given the news. Yeah. I hold on to it because it's when when she was getting out of out of the car at the hospital, and she was going onto the wheelchair. She took it off and told me, uh, Bibs, uh, just hold on to this. And I remember I just put it on, mm -hmm. on my neck. And, uh, I don't put it on all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, even when Daryl was coming out of hospital, I remember I, I just put it on him, and his, I feel her spirit in him. Mm -hmm because he does not cry. He only cries when he's hungry or when he needs to release. <laughs> and he's always jovial, and that's what Drew was. David, you now have an empty home. What, what is the healing process like in, in the quiet and the solemnness of her absence, of the would-be children who would fill the house? What is that like? From the word go, I knew I had to engage myself. I knew I had to engage my, yeah, myself. I had to keep myself busy. Yeah. As he mentioned, you have, there's no way you should let your mind wander. Mm. So what I used to do initially, um, I used to travel a lot, yeah? And I used to do this alone. I just used to pack, you know, a few things of mine and fill up the car and just drive out of any town, check into a hotel with a book and, you know, in and out, in Saturday, out Sunday. But also, a, a, a critical support is, is, is very important. I remember immediately she passed away, there were so many guys that came to see me, there are so many guys who went to see my parents and her parents on the other side. And that support was also overwhelming. But what happens after they leave? Mm. Luckily, because I lost my family. My sister moved in uh, with me. 
she had to clear her house and you know come to stay with me for about a year that really helped a lot there are many people i would want to thank but my family uh, yeah. tops it all yeah. they used to check on me there are friends that used to text me almost on a daily basis every morning before i go to sleep and that would really keep me going that would really keep me um, you know give me the strength to face to face uh, another day yeah. The loss of a loved one and someone whom you had a daily routine is the worst, I think, experience you can ever go through because we had a routine. Saturday morning, wake up late in the morning, have brunch. Sunday, same, have brunch, go for the last mass and do late lunch. But now here you have a weekend. You know, you wake up, you know, there's no one lying next to you. You wake up on Sunday, I would want to go to church, but I can't, mm. for the simple reasons that, you know, I cannot face that day, I cannot face that moment without her. And this person is so much a part of your life and the things yes. that you do, even the mundane, you know, is a constant reminder of, of that individual. And, and Martin, what is it like for you? Because in the room, you see their clothes, for instance. What is that process like, having, having to clear their clothes out and things like that, that you don't think, man, this is also part of the healing process. But for you, Martin, what has it been like? Uh, I'd say my church stood with me, uh, and that is uh, Satan Karen. Uh, they would send people to the house most of the time uh, to just come and pray with us. And, I'm the only one in that church who got the entourage of nearly the full pastoral team from wow. Pastor Carita just coming to stand with us and pray with us. And I thank the church, most of Pastor Tuku and uh, all the pastoral team for the young man, uh, Jabez, my last born. Mm. At times we'd see it and it has me, uh, now mommy has gone to heaven, uh, when am I following mommy to heaven? And, and I think the heaven factor came into because of the Sunday school that we used to take them. And, and most of the time, he became like a celeb in church because all the time the church was praying for him and whatever else. They gave me a relief to walk with him and try to tell him that mommy has gone. But uh, the difficult moment that I also had was my firstborn, who felt like part of my wife going was also me. I wasn't there. It, it, it became a battle with my uh, firstborn. Uh, times we were not even seeing eye to eye. But uh, I thank God uh, through the journey, it, it began to understand that life has to move on, is uh, coming back to his senses. And I know by that time it was adolescence, you know, you're just in your prime and then you lose your mom, who was everything. And uh, we took time before getting the second one, so he was like a mommy's boy. The one week I was in Kisumu, yes, I would say, I had a little fun, you know, but, but when I came back is when I realized, okay, now this is a journey. Yeah, yeah. This is a tough time. The first night that I went to that bedroom, and now I slept, and I was alone. I couldn't. I looked for the young man. We slept together. For a month, it never helped because we would really want to, you know, you're looking at a companion who will be with you, to sleep with you and, and to talk. And you see, you cannot engage him about mommy because I, I didn't understand what him, a seven-year-old kid yeah, yeah. in class two is going through after losing His mom. mom also who was like yeah. everything, accepting, for sure, I've never accepted him today. Uh, I meet friends and tell me, boss, you're strong. Uh, and back in my mind, I said, I, I wish you knew. <laughs> what I go through when I sit, there was a seat, I used to love sit, and there was a, you know, we had separated our chairs. Eh? It was a long one, so me had come and sit and lay my head and watch. And whenever I meet in my chair, I said, no, no, this is my place, and she'd go to her place. Mm. So it became like a haunting. So whenever I come and sit and trying to watch news, I would not concentrate. I would be seeing that she's seated there. Right. I'd find myself talking to myself, asking her, do you like that movie? Until, I don't know what happened, one day, 
the young man was going to the washroom and he heard me talking and he thought maybe a friend came to visit. He has to find me talking and enjoying the movies like I'm talking to somebody. All right, we're going into a short break here on Victoria's Lounge. The conversation certainly continues after this. Stay with us. And George, in your case, the kids are expecting you to be dead fully as you were before Janet left. And it's virtually impossible. So how does that kind of complicate the healing process for you? What I realized was my son, seven, is a replica of his mother. If you see him, he looks exactly like her. It's the same person, same temperament. Um, he's a kid who is always on the stage and on podium in school, he's an artist, very sensitive, very playful, very, it's her. My daughter is a combination of two hours, but she's four and she really didn't get the, the gravity of the death. Um, so first was to deal with him. In fact, one of the most amazing things was she died on April 1st, and on April 5th was his birthday. And we decided we're having it anyway. Because he had been going on and on about his sister's birthday, which the mom attended. And the school came and did a huge party for him at the school, and the school directors did a party at their house for him with all his friends. And I watch him. Um, and when I say there's pain, the massive pain is there's a seven-year-old and a four-year-old who will never see their mother again. You know, it breaks you when you see that. Like, this kid is going to grow up. I don't remember being seven. Yeah. I personally don't remember being seven. I have some memories of a gate or a door or something, but you technically don't know mm. the nitty-gritties about being seven or four. So you're saying this is a person who grew up all their life without the touch of a mother. And that is the most heartbreaking thing mm. to watch. I've been very lucky and a support network of three people just formed itself immediately after the um, event. Um, this is a lady called Nora who walked with us during the, from around October all the way. And somewhere along the way, she had started taking my, my Jasmine to, to the salon. Mm -hmm. And it continued, and they became best friends. And she's literally just stepped in and become like her mother. Wow. Out of the blue, I've seen you, someone I never knew. Wow. Uh, then my, my nanny, nanny of seven years, has just held down the house on a system. My house never lacks. It has this generally a very nice routine. Things are delivered, yeah. I, my work is to pay. It, it's wow. a fully functioning house. Wow. Then we have my sister who stepped up and tries, does it one, two, three. And in between those three, my kids have a semblance of a mother. Yeah. And of course a bigger network um, is a play. But that has been very lucky for me. And so the first few months in terms of my kids was ensuring my kids have some continuity. Um, we sleep in a line. Right. I don't know how these guys do. We sleep one, two, three. Oh, God. My son there, my daughter in the middle of us, <laughs> and myself. That's how we sleep, to date. Wow. Um, I decided, just to keep me distracted, we decided to redo their rooms. I did redo their rooms June, July. Never moved. They never moved. And that part of that, just to touch on something somebody else said, so my, my, uh, the maids in the house needed to rearrange the rooms during the redoing and repainting. Right. So due to cultural differences and in their wisdom, there were a lot of my clothes in my kids' rooms. So they came to our room and wiped out the cupboards. All Janet's clothes were gone. My word. Gone. <laughs> Speechless. Wow. No clothes, nothing. So you, my clothes are carefully arranged. There's nothing. Oh. And you can see they did it out of... They were yeah, yeah. helping. Of course. And her clothes, even her most intimate clothes, had been packed into paper bags. 
and stashed on drawers in the spare bedroom. Wow. It's the small things yeah. that break you. I yeah. broke down yeah. completely. And I started to realize those clothes are not Janet. It hit, I would never have moved those clothes for about three years. But I started realizing that's not Janet. And it was, I, I went, I closed myself in the spare room, pulled down those paper bags, started tearing through them, trying to look even for her lingerie or that gown she would wear or that beautiful Indian dress she was wearing at yeah, the interview. Yeah. You know, and I couldn't find them. It was more frustrating. Then I realized this is not Janet. These clothes are not Janet. I said, wow, this was shocker. And I just sealed them back. And now when I have time, I go, I sift through, take her special garments aside. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying, if, it was, if she was, had a way of communicating, she should say, find a way to help somebody with this. Wow. And for me, I counsel a lot of people, not that I know what I'm saying, but when I'm telling them, Still, you're giving I, can hear, yeah. I can hear my mouth. I say, oh, you, <laughs> there's some sense there. <laughs> so give a lot. Give your time. Uh, I have had horror stories I did not imagine possible. They make me look at my story in a bit uh, much more mm. appreciative way when you hear people's stories. Um, forgive has been another thing. Wow. So it's those little things of giving exactly. that make the whole process. So you start to realize Janet didn't die for nothing. Yeah. There's, there's a message. We have to give hope to cancer patients. Um, you can see there's a common thread. It's either cancer mm. or childbirth. Yeah. There's an issue here. Yes, can absolutely. we start talking about it over and above? Because yeah. I never want anyone to ever go through what we went through. Mm. And this, for me, give has, has been very therapeutic for me. Wow. Yeah. How about you, John? I was so much tra traumatized because after 42 years, I'm now, I'm now alone because the kids are on their own, they are, have their own families. Yeah. But uh, the biggest problem came from friends and other people because every time I met them, Paul is an amze. Paul is an amze. <laughs> so, so they are reminding me, yeah. they keep on reminding me. But when I went to the counselor, he told me, you see, you cannot tell the peop these people not to tell you that. So what you do, have a positive attitude towards, mm. <laughs> towards some of these things. Yeah? And I think I, I got that one. Another problem is that uh, I came to, find, to do things that uh, I was not doing. We have a few chicken at, uh, at the rural area. Mm -hmm. I have to feed them every morning. <laughs> I have to collect a few, a few eggs. Six. I think the counseling has done uh, marvelous for me. Wonderful. Yes. And what has the support of the group been to you? The group of men, what has that been to you? Oh, yes. Some of them are, are very good, Rel relatives and others. They, 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 have been, they have been supporting me. They have been counseling me. I don't know why they say counseling, but they... <laughs> and you know, because you also have a WhatsApp group, and you can talk more about it, Tony, as well, as you talk about your healing process. Your children, four. Yeah. Four children now yes. in your care. Yes. For me, the needs and the demands of the children really keep you on your toes because they have to feed, they have to go to school. Uh, life has to go, um, uh, to go on uh, for everyone. But you realize by the end of the day, when they go to sleep, you go to you, your bedroom alone. So, and that's where the absence is so real, you know. It's so, you know, you almost, you can touch it, you know. One of the heartbreaking moments was to see uh, um, children, um, especially my, our eldest son, um, when he would break down. And uh, when you ask him, he tells you, he misses the mother. And you've got to be there and you have to allow her i mean you have to allow him to cry because uh, crying incidentally is very therapeutic and um, i'm happy that uh, he's getting over it over the time this is our third year but incidentally the young one also sometimes last year could find him crying um, and ask him 
um, goes up and tells me, I miss mom. He was too young. So by the time the mom went, uh, he was only three and a half years. Now he's uh, six years. And uh, all you do is to encourage them. I tell them, anytime you miss mom, you feel like crying, you just cry. It is okay to cry. Yeah, and that has uh, helped. And uh, of course now your presence has to be more than it was uh, before because you're now uh, on your own. So most of the time is that um, in as much as possible, if they're not in school, when they are out in school, I am with them. The biggest mistake we make in life is to think and believe that death is an accident as I have come to realize. Death is a reality, and until we, we understand and accept that life has a beginning and an end, then coping and healing will always become very difficult. And we begin to think there are things we could have done that we did not do, then only that makes the situation much, uh, uh, much worse. So the moment now, you realize that life has a need, you begin to, to see life uh, uh, differently. Mm -hmm. And the question you used to ask God why, then you begin to get an answer that God is so almighty, he has the power to stop anything from happening, and he has the power to make things happen. Therefore, he had the power to stop pulling from going. Therefore, if he has the power, he had the power to stop pulling going, Pauline went because God allowed it. Then when that truth began to sink, slowly by slowly, day by day, then you accept the reality of life, that death is real, and you begin also to see your own vulnerability. Then you also realize your wife was a gift. It is not a girl you met and you fall in love with. <laughs> God sent that angel to you. And unless God brings another angel to you, it will be futile. You only um, destroy the life of your children because you understand that uh, it is not so much about the person who comes into your life accepting you and the children. It's also the issue of children accepting them. And if they fail to accept the person who has come into your life, then that's a problem. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard it that way. <laughs> yeah, but it's amazing. I'm sure it will help so many people. Unfortunately, we have to bring this to a close, but I don't think we've even scratched the surface in terms of what you've experienced. But what you've shared, I want to thank each and every one of you so much for your bravery, for your candor. It's going to go a long way in helping a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you for, from the team as well, because we're also very appreciative for your time. And just before we wrap up, we also have a beautiful tribute, the least we could do, to your late wives that the audience can also share in. And we also ask that you share some of your experiences. Hopefully that can heal someone who's going through the same. Thank you for watching. I'm Victoria Rubadiri. Thank you to the Pride Inn Hotel for hosting us. Have a wonderful evening, and let's do this next week. Enjoy the tribute. <laughs>